so we've got Aaron with us today, who is the outreach coordinator at the Rumberg Tiburon Center. She's been there for over 10 years, and she's been kayaking in the bay for about eight years. So let's welcome Erin. Thank you all. I, uh, now I can see you now that I have my glasses on. <laughs> Um, so thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm really excited to, uh, to be able to present here. I, um, I have been kayaking uh, with Sea Trek and Environmental Traveling Companions since 2008. Um, so it's, it's really fun to be able to talk to fellow kayakers about the bay. Um, so the Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies is where I work. And, oh, is this cord gonna? Uh, so you may ask yourself, what is Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies? Does anyone know? What was the question? What is Romberg Tiburon <laughs> Center for Environmental Studies? You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, in my field, education, what we like to do is gauge people's level of knowledge before we start talking. <laughs> is, that, is that where they made the net? Across the Golden Gate yes, yes, that will, that will, 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 will cover that. But that was, it wasn't called Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies then. It was called the Navy Net Depot. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I'll tell you. Um, it's the Marine and Environmental Research Center for, of San Francisco State University. So obviously we're the, the, t the Marin campus of San Francisco State University. Um, it's the only academic research center located on the shore of San Francisco Bay. And so, where is Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies? Maybe you guys know that. Have you paddled by it before? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 All right, so uh, this map here shows uh, where San Francisco State is in relation to um, RTC, as we call it for short. Um, so it's about 20 miles away, right on the Tiburon Peninsula. And our mission, which we just rewrote, we've just gone through a strategic planning process, and our mission is now to illuminate the vital connections between science, society, and the sea to ensure healthy and resilient ecosystems for future generations. I had to cheat because I'm still learning it. Um, so we were, it was founded in 1978, and it started with just one scientist and there's a handful of graduate students. Um, and now we have 13 scientists or investigators, and usually about 50 graduate students at any given time. Um, and also undergraduate students that are conducting research, um, a wide array of fundamental research that informs um, conservation and advances understanding of marine and estuarine environments in San Francisco Bay and around the world. And that's also from our strategic plan. Um, but long before that, to talk a little bit about the history. So it's had a long and rich history. Um, it, uh, in the early, or the late 1800s, well, let's actually go back even further. Um, there, people have said that the site was uh, used by the Miwok tribes. Um, we don't have any written record of that, but um, there is evidence and lots of people have, uh, have been saying this. So we'd love to find the, you know, the, the, some, some actual evidence that we can point to uh, so we can be sure that that's correct. But um, it does, does make sense if you've seen where it is on the Tiburon Peninsula. It actually was originally a cove, so it would be a great place for uh, not necessarily a village, but uh, a camp for hunting and fishing. Um, and then but it was granted by the Mexican um, government at the time to John Richardson in the 1830s, and he had a, a brick kiln and he grazed cattle on the land. Of course, he had a whole lot more land than just the Tiburon Peninsula. Um, then in the late 1800s until 1904, it supported a cod packing plant. So these codfish were caught up in the um, North Pacific in Alaska and brought down here to be um, dried, and a lot of it was used for cod liver oil. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can see there was just a cove at that time. 
and, uh, and now that cove is built upon. Okay, so then it was a Navy coaling station. Um, so it's been in, in Navy, it was in Navy hands for many years. So in 1904, they um, purchased the site and built the first coaling station on the West Coast uh, that operated until 1931. And the coal was sent by train from the East Coast, uh, most likely Appalachia, to um, fuel the Navy's steamships, which is, um, they used coal at the time for the steamships. And they had the largest gantry crane in the West at the time. Um, a portion of it still stands, so if you're ever um, come out to come out to Romberg Tiburon Center. You can see that, um, and we find chunks of coal on the site all the time now. As we've been doing some uh, excavations in different parts of the site, we're finding these chunks of coal everywhere. Uh, and then in, in 1908, Teddy Roosevelt himself actually visited the site with the Great White Fleet to uh, refuel. This is going to change. Try that again. Uh, okay. So then in 1933, they uh, used part of the site to um, put these bundles of cables, 400 pound bundles of cables from Roebling and Son in New Jersey to, um, onto reels that was then barged over to the Golden Gate Bridge construction site. And they, there they were spun into the catenary or, or hanging you know, uh, vertical cables for the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so there are a couple of warehouses up in one part of our site. And then in the, also in the 30s, um, the Navy gave part of the site to what is now the uh, Maritime Academy in Vallejo, um, the CS, and then part of the CSCS system. Um, and there's some barracks under construction. So we repurposed just about uh, many buildings on our site that um, were military buildings. So the barracks are now our um, marine operations and facility shop. There we go. So um, really heavy activity was happening um, with the net depot. So the Navy, uh, before World War, before we entered World War II, started building um, and maintaining these submarine nets. So they made submarine nets and they made torpedo nets. Um, the submarine nets you can see laid out here on, um, on the tarmac. So they built this over that cove that was originally there. Um, and you can see the picture in the top left that there's you know, a whole bunch of stuff laid out there. Um, there's a wharf that is no longer there, unfortunately, where the net tenders, um, especially designed ships that came up and received the nets to go out and um, deploy uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge and on other places. So if you can see at the top right, the net actually strung across the uh, Golden Gate. It went from um, a Chrissy Field area over to, um, uh, almost, let's see, if I remember where it, it went over into Sausalito. I think it was somewhere over to, to well, almost to Richardson Bay. Um, I think it's Yellow Bluff. Isn't that where the attachments yeah, are? Where you can see we them. see them. In oh, the the, wall you can see the attachments? Oh, I have to check I think that someone out. told me that's what those are, but I'm not sure if that's true. That's really cool. But there's things sticking out of the cliff there. Ah. I don't think you'd want to bring it up that much farther because it's a, kind of a corner. Right, there. right. But they did extend. That was the obvious place. It was eight miles long, ultimately. It was much longer than the actual Blue Bridge. Seven or eight miles long. Um, seven tons. And um, you can see, it's funny because the, you know, they have these, you know, thou these anchors that they have were like thousands of pounds, you know, um, really heavy, heavy anchors that they put down at the bottom of these nets. And yet, as you guys all know, the currents in San Francisco Bay, you can see the currents pulling on the net, even with the you know thousands and thousands of pounds of weight on the bottom of them. Then um, there were also uh, floats at the top. Uh, and then when, they, uh, when friendly ships needed to come in, there were boats there attending the net, and they opened it like a curtain and let the boats in and closed it back up again. I'm glad to hear that, um, that Bill Keener is coming to talk to you because um, one of the 
the reasons that he thinks that harbor porpoises were absent from the bay for so many years is because of these nets. Um, that they, you know, and I think the, the, between the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge and the submarine nets and, you know, all the development in the bay and the dredging and the, you know, toxic sediments that were in the bay for many years, um, I, I wouldn't want to come back if I were them either. So it's a good sign that they're coming back. And then in 1961, the Navy turned it over to the Department of the Interior where they established a new um, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Center. Um, and they also had a Marine Minerals Technology Center. And this ship on the right is actually, was a converted from a net tender. So that's what the ships look like. Uh, and they, that ship went out to sea to um, mine manganese and other minerals. Now, a lot of people say that, well, that was just a cover story. They were actually looking for an enemy submarine that was down in the deep ocean. Um, so uh, I can send this presentation to someone if you want to get the links, because there's a lot more historical photos that we have on a Flickr site, um, if you want to see more of those. So finally, in 1978, um, the land, the Department of Commerce um, offered up the land for lease to educational organizations or environmental organizations. So um, the dean of, our, of our, the University of College of Science and Engineering at the time convinced the president that you know we should take advantage, take this land. It's a great spot, and then we can do environmental research there. Um, so they got the um, they got 26 acres for one dollar on the Timber Island. So it was <laughs> it was a 30 year lease, and so in 2008 the university became the owners of the property. Um, so you can see comparison of the site the way it looked in the 1940s, and also notice well it's a little hard to tell in that picture. But there are other pictures, aerial photos of the time, um, where there's very few trees on the Timber Peninsula. It's pretty open grassland, like much of California. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's more trees in the picture in, in 2004. Um, and so this is what it looks like now. So that big white A-frame building that you might see when you're piling by, that is our main laboratory. So most of the research, um, laboratory research is done in there. Um, the building on the right um, was the theater during the Navy Net, Net Depot days, uh, but it is also used as lab space now, um, which has been an amazing feat of improvisation and uh, engineering. Um, so there's a couple of labs that need different conditions from the main lab. One of them um, uses carbon isotopes and you can't have any contamination with that, so that's in a separate lab. Um, and then another um, uh, needs just really complicated systems uh, to mimic ocean conditions. So that's in a, a separate building. And then up on the hill, um, you can see the, there's a water tower up there, and that was one of the first buildings that was built in 1904 during the coaling station days. It was for fire suppression. And, I, and then I heard in the 60s, there, were, there was a band that would practice in there because it had such great acoustics. Um, so one of these days I might go inside and check it out. And then um, down on the bottom, uh, bottom up there is our monitoring pier that was built in, I want to say 2005, 2006. Um, and so we have instruments out on the pier that are measuring the temperature, the salinity, uh, the turbidity, or the, how much cloudy the water is, um, and then photosynthetic activity. So there's a number of you know, parameters in the water and also weather parameters that it is measuring in real time. Uh, and so if you go to um, our website there, um, you can see what the conditions are. Uh, we also monitored um, well, I'll get back to that later, but we, we also were monitoring currents, but that's being done by someone else now. But we'll go back to that later. Um, okay, so just a kind of a wrap up, roundup of our research. Um, 
that we have uh, biogeochemistry, which is basically the study of the carbon cycle and nutrients. So one scientist studies um, what happens to the carbon in sediments in the ocean, and uh, another couple of labs look at nutrients, and they've, they've uh, for several years, have looked at the different types of nutrients that are coming out of the two sewage treatment plants on the, Sa the um, San Joaquin and Sacramento River. So the Sacramento River has a higher level of treatment for their sewage, and so they release nitrate, which is traditionally a better source of nitrogen, better nutrient for the phytoplankton, which is the base of the food chain. And the San Joaquin River doesn't treat as well, and so it releases ammonium, um, which is a little trickier for the phytoplankton to use. Um, biological oceanography basically talks about the the little microscopic things that are in the water, so plankton, phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, and those those food webs. Uh, microbial ecology. There, we have a couple of labs that are, go, fall into that category, and the harmful algal blooms that have been in the news a lot lately is the focus of one of those labs, um, and also ocean acidification and the impact of ocean acidification on those little microscopic single-celled plants. So let me stop right there. How, raise your hand if you know what ocean acidification is. Well, that's pretty good. Okay, so um, just for review, <laughs> for those that, that might not know that so much about it. So everybody's heard of climate change, yes? Okay, so ocean acidification is what we call climate change's evil twin. And um, so all the excess carbon dioxide that human activities are putting into the atmosphere will get dissolved in the ocean. The ocean actually absorbs one third of the CO2 that, uh, that we're putting out. And so the more CO2 that's dissolved in the water, it reacts with the water to form carbonic acid. And it also takes away uh, car the carbonate ions that are in the water that animals with shells use to build their shells. So there's two problems. It's um, this addition of carbonic acid is lowering the pH of the ocean, uh, and it's it's you know making that carbonate less available for the animals to build their shells. Um, so that's just one aspect of ocean acidification. But our scientists are finding out that it's actually having a lot more impacts than just that, than just on shelled organisms. Um, okay, and then evolutionary ecology, um, there's a lab that studies a wide variety of organisms looking at population genetics, so how the populations are related, how they're connected, and they do a lot of work with invasive species. Have you guys heard of sea vomit? Okay, I didn't include a picture of it, but you can imagine what it looks like. It looks like vomit. So um, it is actually all over Richardson Bay. It's, it's basically all over the bay. It's just like drippy yellow stuff that's like on docks and rocks and everywhere. And it just, it basically just covers everything like a carpet. Um, so it's been a big problem up in Alaska with the herring fisheries up there. Um, and it's highly invasive. It's, it also was a problem with oyster aquaculture um, in like Tamales Bay. Uh, it, well, what it is, is um, actually more closely related to us than any other invertebrate animal. It's sort of a, the bridge between invertebrates and vertebrates. You could say what it is, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I will. So um, it's called a tunicate. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and so, the, you know, they, in their larval stage, they have a nerve cord, primitive nerve cord, like, like humans do. Um, and then we have uh, wetland ecology, which I'll talk more about tonight. Um, it's a lot of uh, restoration work, especially with eelgrass, and also some uh, work with sea level rise. Uh, geography for the conservation of marine mammals, that's where those harbor porpoises and bottlenose dolphins come in. Um, so the video you guys were talking about were the humpback whales, but did you guys also see the video of the dolphin jumping? Yeah. Um, so. The porpoises came in, the, the bottomless dolphins were also coming in, but the porpoises were coming in and, and you know eating fish and they were, seemed to be just doing just great. And uh, there were lots of them uh, in, coming into the bay. And then finally the bottomless dolphins decided to beat up on them. Um, so I'm not sure 
now because I haven't been monitoring them lately, but Bill could certainly tell you next month uh, how the harbor porpoises are doing because um, bottlenose dolphins, you know, unlike what you see on TV, the flipper, they're, they're bullies, they're the meanies. So, um, but they're fun to watch, so um, it's interesting stuff. And then we do a little bit of physical oceanography, mostly with that bay and ocean monitoring, with our monitoring pier. Um, we're also going to have a CO2 buoy um, deployed in uh, near Angel Island, I think in Richard, Richardson Bay, no, sorry, uh, Raccoon Straits. Um, and it's a bright yellow geometrically shaped buoy. So once it goes in, you won't miss it. <laughs> uh, so you'll know that's what it's for. It's measuring a lot of these other, these same parameters that we've been measuring, plus the CO2 content in the water. Um, the ocean acidification thing is tricky in San Francisco Bay because it's an estuary. And you guys know what estuary is, yeah? Um, so the pH in an estuary fluctuates a lot. So it's not, it's not really, it's hard to really tell if ocean acidification is happening um, in the bay based on the pH. So this buoy measuring the level of CO2 will give us a better indication of whether that's happening in the bay. And the Coast Guard's agreed to placement of this buoy? Well, we're still going through the permitting process right now, which is very lengthy. Okay. And it's, it's, well, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to be. It, I just, you know, Angel Island, I thought I'd heard Raccoon Street, but uh, somewhere near, somewhere near Angel Island, maybe not yeah, in the street. Of 150 large sailboats passing through there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's going to be, br it's bright yellow. Um, and uh, we also have to get permits from BCDC and all that good stuff. So we're working on it. Uh, we also do a lot of collaborative research with uh, partners that are uh, headquartered on our site. We do have uh, actually 36 acres now, so there's plenty of room for other researchers. We have the San Francisco Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, um, which we call for ease of use SF Bay NUR. It's a lot easier that way. Um, and they have sites up at Rush Ranch, um, which is a much more uh, freshwater area. And then they have a site at China Camp. Um, and the, they're called Sentinel sites. And so they're sites that are have been minimally impacted by human activity, human development. And so they're good, like, living laboratories to see, you know, sort of the baseline, how the environment is doing. Um, and they also run a coastal training program uh, for decision makers. Um, and they also do a wetland science series for um, professionals in, the, uh, you know, working with wetlands uh, to learn how to like use GIS and uh, delineate wetlands and the birds in the wetlands. And so there's a wide variety of classes that are offered. Uh, and then the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center has been on our site for um, a number of years. And in 2008, I believe it was, or was it 2012? Anyway, a few years ago, we had signed a memorandum of understanding with, um, with them. This, they have their West Coast Marine Invasions Lab on our site. Um, and most of the Smithsonian sites are in the Atlantic. Uh, so we signed this memora memorandum of understanding to, you know, really partner closely with them. They were starting this new uh, initiative called Marine Geo, um, which is a global um, environmental monitoring network. And San Francisco Bay is gonna, was going to be the first West Coast site. All the other sites were at Smithsonian uh, research sites um, in the Atlantic. And so they actually just started doing the monitoring this summer, like in June. And so um, it was very exciting. There's unfortunately not much press coverage of it, even though I tried, um, but it was in the Tiburon Arc newspaper. Uh, and that's happening uh, in Richardson Bay as well. And so they're gonna come back next year to follow up. Uh, so these things in red are some things that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. So ocean acidification, harmful algal blooms, organisms' responses to climate change, um, habitat restoration and sea level rise, and uh, actually I, I may not do a lot with the Bay and Ocean monitoring. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so uh, ocean acidification, upwelling, and toxic algae. They're, sounds like a terrible thing. Um, <laughs> So one of our scientists, Dr. Bill Coughlin, has been working on this for a number of years. He's 
He's worked on harmful algal blooms for many years, and now ocean acidification has entered the mix. And one thing that scientists found were happening off the coast of California, um, you, do you, have, you know about what upwelling, what upwelling is? Yeah, so the upwelling that was happening off the coast of California was really low pH. So it was called acidified upwelling. And so they did this cruise along the California coast to see you know, how is this impacting um, the phytoplankton. Um, so on the left, you can see a couple of graduate students that are collecting water samples from what's called a CTD rosette, conductivity, temperature, and depth. And so they collect these water samples and they can analyze them in, in many different ways um, in the lab on board the ship. Um, so out on the deck, they have these incubators, which um, have all of these uh, wires and connections, and they can put different amounts of CO2 into the water to mimic um, the, the different uh, uh, pH, to get different, different pH levels in each of those bottles. Um, then they also uh, will sample the, the, the water for, for uh, probably, I think it's nutrients at the top, and then the bottom, um, they're measuring uh, chlorophyll. So and that's a measure of how, of how much phytoplankton is in that water. Um, so they, and they also just recently went out on another one of these cruises with, uh, so this, was, this cruise was um, based on a grant for um, Dr. Coughlin and his colleagues. So it was a smaller group. They, uh, there was a huge um, West Coast ocean acidification cruise that uh, NOAA uh, ran um, all along the coast from Baja all the way up to Canada. And uh, so they were also out on that earlier this year as well, um, doing similar work. Um, the ocean acidification has um, been found to affect the nutritional quality of phytoplankton. So, you know, they're an important part of the food web and the, the lipids or fatty acids that they have are not as good under ocean acidification. Um, the other thing they've been studying is how does ocean acidification affect the toxics, um, whether the algae is toxic or not, and how much. Um, and so this is something that's like new research, um, you know, because they still don't know what causes the algae to produce the toxin in the first place. And so um, they're looking at ocean acidification as, as one factor. So the, in the center, the, that's called the um, incubation tank. And so there are big bottles of, um, of water, the ocean water, and they put in um, the, the tubes and the wires in there are to um, pipe in CO2 gas. Um, and so the wires is all computerized so that they you know, keep the, the CO2 at the proper level and keep the pH at the level that they want it. Pardon? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't want to drink that soda. Um, all right. So then you probably heard about uh, this toxic algae and your dinner table. Who likes Dungeness crab? Yeah. So it's kind of a bummer this year, right? Um, so it was a really bad toxic algae bloom. Shut down the Dungeness uh, crab fishery this past winter almost, almost completely. It finally did open, uh, but not for very long. Um, and so this is the first time we've seen Dungeness crab be affected by this algae. You may have heard in past years about uh, sea lions, you know, at the Marine Mammal Center being affected by um, this demoic acid uh, toxin in this algae. Um, pelicans, uh, fish, um, you know, those things have been affected by it. But this is the first time we've seen this problem in Dungeness crab. And there's a lot more monitoring that's going on right now. Um, but, you know, what Dr. Coughlin kept saying is, you know, he was interviewed repeatedly about this, um, is that there's no funding to try to discover uh, what's causing, what causes the, algae, the toxin to be produced. Um, you know, even though it's affecting, you know, a multi-million dollar industry. So hopefully something will, will come out of that. But this um, the picture on the right is... Um, the diatom that produces that demoic acid toxin, and it forms chains. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's called a pennate diatom, which means it's like pen-shaped. Um, and uh, it's, it's called Pseudonychia australis, um, is the one that's 
that's causing most of these toxic algae blooms. How long is one of those pins? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they're, they're on the order of microns. So you catch them with a net that is, let's say, 35 microns, which is a million, so this is a millionth of a meter. Oh, yeah. yeah. Microscopic view it, of it. Definitely microscopic view, yeah. Really good microscope, <laughs> which we have at, uh, at RTC. Okay, then um, there's a whole other lab that's devoted to um, looking at the impact of climate change on marine organisms, um, and mostly they study these little crabs called porcelain crabs. Um, so you can see on the left, that's um, a former graduate student, now a research technician. He's uh, gonna hook uh, one of these little flat porcelain crabs up to an electrode that's gonna measure its heart rate, and they will change the temperature of the water um, to see you know, what, what they can tolerate. Um, and so they've found that um, the, sorry, the increase in temperature, um, these, these animals live in the intertidal already. And so they're already having to deal with a um, wide variety of temperatures. And the, the increase in temperature with climate change um, kind of is the straw that broke the camel's back. It's just like it reaches the breaking point. Um, they've also studied the impact on um, the embryos, which are on the, uh, on the right, but uh, the top, uh, like they're in the middle. Uh, and then you can see the larvae on the right. Um, it's got this spine that's starting to uncurl. And then um, the bottom, the middle of the bottom, is the, that's how long the spine is. Um, so these, their larvae are really interesting. And then you can see a full-size porcelain crab here. So they live under the rocks um, to try to protect themselves from the temperature. Their, their current um, research study that they're still setting up, because it's very complicated, um, they're, they're actually, for, this is the first time anybody's looked at the indirect effects of uh, climate change. So there's two species of porcelain crabs. One lives lower in the intertidal zone, and one lives higher. And the, what's happening is the, the crab that lives higher in the intertidal is retreating lower to try to escape the higher temperatures. Um, and it is cr crowding out the species that was already there. It's competing, um, you know, there's, aggr there's aggression between them. And so um, this study is looking at um, you know, how does that actually happen? You know, what, what's going on with this? So it's the first time that um, they've studied the in, indirect impacts of climate change on a, on a species. <laughs> okay, uh, then uh, another big research project um, we've had for many years is the steelgrass research and restoration. So the research is on like how, what is the best way to restore eelgrass? Um, so they've looked at planting, you know, dropping seeds, they've looked at transplanting shoots. Um, so here's sort of the whole process. So on the top um, left, they're out at Point Molati collecting um, eelgrass shoots. Uh, and that's one of the little boats that they use to, to get out there. Um, they use boogie boards too, because you know it helps carry the stuff around. Uh, Wetsuits. Um, it's very muddy, so that's a lot of fun. Um, so they collect in these buckets um, 100 shoots of eelgrass, and those are the vegetative shoots. They, they, they don't have any reproductive structures on them. And in the bags, they collect. Uh, I believe it's also 100 um, flowering shoots. And so, uh, you, you guys have seen eelgrass out there in Bay, right? It's all over. Um, and did you know that it was a flowering plant? Yeah. You did. So, um, so the close-up picture shows, you can see, I don't know if you can see those little bumps on there. Those are the seeds of the eelgrass. And so, um, they put those in these bags and they suspend the bags uh, out where they want to restore the eelgrass with a buoy and the seeds will drop into the sediment and sprout up. And so they, they deployed these over in um, uh, Corte Madera Marsh and you know where the windsurfers like to 
do their thing. Um, and so they had we had to do kind of an outreach campaign to them because you know the the windsurfers were upset that there were these things out in the water that were in their way. And um, so you know we had to try to tell them, well, you know, this is a really cool thing we're doing. Um, so then they so they collect the shoots, take them back to Rombert Tiburon Center, rinse them off, get all the parasites off of them, and then they'll attach them to bamboo stakes, and they color code them depending on what uh, where they're going to be replanted. Um, then they take a little piece of burlap and a, and a twist tie, um, and attach that, and then they'll plant it into the sediment where they want to to transplant it. Um, and so all of that is biodegradable. So the idea is that all, that all eventually biodegrade and the eelgrass will take root and grow up in that spot. Um, so in the top right, there are students that are taking data on um, the flowering rates of the, of, this, of the eelgrass in this particular bed. Um, and I, like, judging from where the Richmond Bridge is, I believe that's probably Point Melati as well, because I think that's looking south. Um, and then they also are studying the animals that are living in the eelgrass. So on the bottom left, you can see there's a little blob there that's a, that's a sea hare. Um, they're very well camouflaged with the eelgrass. They're called, it's called Taylor's sea hare, or Phyloplasia taylori. Um, and so they actually eat, um, they graze the algae off the blades of eelgrass. So they're beneficial organisms for the eelgrass. There are other invasive species in the eelgrass called amphipods that actually chew on the eelgrass. So they're not so good. So they've looked at like the different impacts of these different animals living in the eelgrass. Um, so yeah, next time if you guys are out kayaking the eelgrass, you know, if it's if it's the right tide where you can actually you know look at the eelgrass, see if you can find any of these guys. Once you see one, it's like the it's like that magic picture or whatever. Once you see one, like oh, they're everywhere. So, uh, and also um, the lab that's studying the um, environmental physiology, the uh, with climate change and, and uh, impact on organisms, they're also um, looking at the impact on the sea hares. So it's not just porcelain crabs, um, it, but it's not just uh, temperature. It's also salinity because changing salinity will also be a part of climate change with less fresh water, less rain, more drought, less, less fresh water making it down to the bay. So the salinity of the bay is likely to increase. <laughs> Doesn't respond the first time. Okay, uh, so the monitoring. Um, again, uh, we have data available. Oh. Delayed reaction. Oh, so, whoa, whoa, wrong way. Okay. Uh, yeah, so like I said, the, the, we have um, equipment down there. We also have a hydrophone. I forgot to mention we have a hydrophone on the pier, and that data is available on a different website, but you can still find it through our website. You can get to it. Um, there's a, a professor of physics, a retired professor of physics, that has a hydrophone out on the on the pier, um, and he is interested in the sounds of the toadfish, or the plain fin midshipman. Um, and the toadfish has a face only a mother toadfish could love. Um, and you may have also heard about this. Um, in the 60s, the folks that were living in the houseboat community in Sausalito reported hearing these strange humming noises, and they thought they were like aliens or something. Um, but you know, you know what people in the '60s and the also the houseboat community were up to. So, um, but they actually were, <laughs> they actually were these toadfish. So the male toadfish actually does this humming to attract mates, and they usually only do it at night. It's a nocturnal activity. But there was one time last summer where there was humming constantly for an entire day during the daylight, and you know, Dr. Bland still hasn't figured out what was happening there. Um, but you can go to this website and you can listen to little snippets of sound from this hydrophone. You can also hear like ship noise so you can kind of see what animals in the water are dealing with when with all these um, ship traffic going around in San Francisco Bay. 
Uh, and then the picture on the right is an HF radar tower. Um, there are several of these around San Francisco Bay. So there's one here um, at RTC. There is one, um, there's, they actually have to have two because they have to bounce off of each other. The waves have to bounce off of each other. So um, you can only really get information on the surface currents if you have two across from each other. So there are there is data on surface currents in um, much of the central, like San Francisco Bay near the Golden Gate. Um, unfortunately, not very much of Rocky and Straits. That would be a really useful place. Um, a little bit into um, Richardson Bay, but then uh, along the, the Tiburon Peninsula, there's um, in data on the surface currents. Um, so uh, the scientist who was doing that work had left Romberg Tiburon Center, so now uh, Bodega Marine Lab, UC Davis, is, is taking over that work. The HF radar tower is still on our site, but you would go um, to um, Bodega Bay. And, and, but I'm, I think you can still access the um, site from our website, which is just rtc.sfsu.edu. So I'll probably find it all there. Um, so it's not just research that we do at Romberg Tiburon Center, it's also education. We're training the next generation of scientists. So we do, um, there's many, like I said, many graduate students and our faculty advise the graduate students and mentor them on their research. Um, we also have undergraduate courses, SF State undergraduate courses that come out and have field trips or classes on our site. Um, we have summer intern programs, which are going on right now. So we have a uh, NSF-funded research experience for undergraduates. Um, so these are people that are, these are students who are may, they're not sure if they want to be scientists or not, but they're going to you know, check it out. And um, usually it's underrepresented minorities um, that, that will um, try that out. And we also have um, a teacher researcher program. So for um, people that are studying to be teachers um, or are in their first year of teaching, um, they'll get a chance to do some research in a lab with scientists. And like I said, the Wetland Science Series courses um, are also part of our education mission. And then outreach, like I'm doing right now. Um, and that's really all I have. So any questions? There's a lot more than I could tell you. But trying to keep. Yes. Do you need volunteers? Volunteers. Well, that's a good question. So. Um, at the moment, we don't have volunteer programs going, but we are planning on initiating some. So we're starting a Friends of RTC volunteer group, and we're going to be developing walking tours of the site. And so we'll be looking for volunteer docents. Um, and you know, there are there are some labs that uh, that will accept volunteers to help them with the research. So um, you know, it's it's certainly you know never a bad idea to ask. Um, but yes, yeah, so the Friends of RTC formal, you know, volunteer group is, is, is coming. Um, we haven't started that up yet, but thank you for asking. Yes? Is um, RTC open to the public? Another really good question. It is open to the public one, more or less one day a year. So we have our open house every year um, where we invite families from the community to come and see what we're doing. So we kind of show off all of our research. So that's just once a year. But um, there are sometimes, you know, other opportunities that come up during the year. So uh, if you know about the Bay Area Science Festival that's um, been happening in the Bay, um, we do have tours um, as part of the Bay Area Science Festival, and that's in October, so you can look out for that. Um, and we have a weekly seminar series that is open to the public during the school year. So the fall semester will be starting up at the end of August. And we have uh, two public forums a year. So we invite um, pretty well-known scientists to come and speak uh, about their research to the public. Um, so there are opportunities to come and learn about things that are happening at RTC, but as far as getting to like see the whole site, it's um, really once or twice a year. But like I said, we're gonna be starting those walking tours up. Um, I, I don't have a, a timeline for you, but we, we're working on getting that started, and so there will be more opportunities for the public to see the site in the future. Okay. Are those weights for the submarine that's still there on the Golden Gate? No, they are, a lot of them are on our site. So, you know, we could have used them as a, as a um, barrier on our seawall, and 
among other places. Um, the floats, many of the floats, were actually turned into beehives, which is which is really interesting. We have a couple of them still on our site as like a little display. Um, but yeah, we have many of them um, on our site, and they're they're actually sort of they form brick wrap along part of our um, the north end of our property, close to Paradise um, County Park, the Paradise um, not Paradise Cape, Paradise County Park. Yes. Uh, do you do any research that would contribute to understanding how desalination would affect the bay and organisms and things like that? Oh, good question. You know, we actually had a private company that was using um, part of our site to to study um, desalinization or to try. I mean, I don't know if they were coming at it from a scientific angle. I think they were saying like, is it cost effective? Could we do it? Um, and they they are no longer there. Um, and I'm not sure if it was, you know, because we realized, no, we don't want to support something like this, and uh, or if they just decided, no, this isn't, you know, worthwhile. Um, but so none of our scientists were working with that company to see what was happening. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I think if we find out what the impact of increasing salinity is on the organisms in the bay, that would certainly give a clue to what would happen with the desalinization. Yes. So the places where they, they're uh, slowly turning the former salt pens back into wetlands, how, how much salt does that uh, sort of flush into the bay? What's the story with that? Oh, I don't, I don't know about that one. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think who, who would be a good source for that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, is there a significant change that you've seen, whether positive or negative, due to climate change, like in the last few years or so? Um, due to climate change, I mean, I think it's. Or any significant changes in the bay? You know? Yeah. So, so there are a lot of positive changes in the bay um, because of you know, cleaning up um, and and curtailing pollution. Um, so the bay is in a lot of ways in better shape than it was. It's certainly in better shape than it was in the 60s as far as the health, the water quality and um, sediments and, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and seeing animals come back that haven't been here for a while, like the, the porpoises and the, the dolphins. Um, and there also was a, a story, you guys read Bay Nature? You read Bay Nature, the magazine? It's a quarterly magazine. It's really great. I highly recommend it. Um, so in the most recent issue, there's an article about the return of this plant that was considered gone from San Francisco Bay. Um, and so it's over in the East Bay, um, and it looks like a little, um, like a bottle brush kind of thing. It's, you know, uh, bristly. Um, and it is, uh, it's called um, blight, sea blight, B-L-I-T-E. Um, and so it's been um, really good. So one of our scientists, Dr. Kathy Boyer, has been working on this with her students. And um, Peter, I, I'm blanking on his name. There's a, an ecologist that's been sort of leading the way on restoring this plant because um, what they found is that it thrives on um, decaying eelgrass. Uh, and it also can help with... Um, sea level rise, so it's like this perfect you know, situation where they can restore this plant that will really have an impact on, a positive impact on the environment. Um, so yeah, there's definitely been impact seen with climate change, um, but one of the big um, reasons for doing the eelgrass restoration is it actually can mitigate climate change. And so that's the thing, it's like people, we're not talking about stopping climate change anymore. It's too late for that. It's happening. So now the, the focus is to adapt and mitigate um, to try to you know, make it less bad. Um, so planting eelgrass beds um, reduces wave action in those areas, so that will help with sea level rise impacts. Um, it also settles sediment down um, to make the water more clear, although in some places that's not a good thing, like Aska Delta smelt if it prefers the water clear or cloudy. Um, if the water is clear, it's easy for their predators to see them. So I think the Delta smelts would rather have cloudy water. 
Um, so they kind of hide in little channels to avoid predators. Um, but as you all know, a lot of the, the sediment in San Francisco Bay came from the gold rush. Um, and it was a lot of toxic sediment because they used mercury and selenium to get the, the gold out of the rocks. So, um, so that the sediment, you know, sort of settling and moving out is a good thing. Yeah, well, I'll answer sure the first question first because so that's the easier one. <laughs> we do have international students, um, usually one or two a year. Um, we also have postdoctoral researchers um, that come from other countries. Um, so, so yes, we, we definitely have had international students. Um, at, you know, pretty regular. As far as the biggest threat, it would be hard for me to to pick one out. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of good work being done in the Bay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, probably uh, non-point source pollution, maybe, is what I would say, um, you know, aside from climate change. Uh, one of the research projects that I didn't mention that, um, that one of our students did was on microplastics. And so I know you've all heard about the little tiny microscopic bits of plastic that are all over the ocean, like trillions of them. Um, and so she was doing research on um, whether metals, heavy metals, are attached to biofilms or like the out film of algae that would attach to little pieces of plastic. Um, and, you know, she she had a lot of you know fits and starts, so there's more research that needs to be done in that area. But um, just the fact that that you know so much of it does get into the bay and it, and it impacts the food chain. Uh, Any time that you know, after a, a rain, like and you know, I think that'll be happening less often, but after a rain and everything goes out the storm drains, there's like so much trash in the bay. Um, so that I would say that is a is a threat to um, the health of the bay. So yeah, I agree, use your reusable water bottles, say no to straws, all that good stuff. Yes? Yeah, earlier you, you were talking about the sludge that forms on the piers and on the rocks. Oh, the sea vomit, yes. And I thought I heard you say that there's an animal that has a spine outside when it's in a larval form. It, it is an animal. So sea vomit is an animal. It's a colonial animal. Does it die and then become sea vomit, or is that alive? <laughs> you know, it's alive. It's like it is, right? Yeah, it's a colony of animals. Okay. So the the nerve cord that it has is in, is in the larval stage, and then it goes through a metamorphosis, and it loses that nerve cord. Um, so it's... Um, it's you know something that where we have similarity in the, in the larval stage. So embryos, obviously we you know we have a nerve cord and they have a nerve cord in the larval stage. So they're they're called urochordates because they're not quite chordates, but they're close. Um, they're not really invertebrates, uh, but they're not vertebrates either. So they're like you know. Sort of Are they all bond together? In in the colony. Yeah. Um, you know the the sea vomit is really hard to tell, hard to see a pattern of individuals, um, you know, I'm actually not sure how they're arranged, but other tunicates, um, colonial tunicates, um, that you may have seen on, um, on docks and things have these beautiful little star shapes or flower shapes to them, and, you know, they're pretty colors, There's, in fact, our newsletters, which, um, I have three issues of our newsletter that you're welcome to take, um, but this is what some of them look like. So they're like really pretty. So I don't know, is it like a 64th of an inch or is it like microscopic? The actual animal? Yeah. Oh, do you find a picture? Yeah. The actual animal, that's pretty gruesome. Yeah. It is gruesome, <laughs> yes. So the well, animal that's in there is like what? A micron or a 16th of an inch? Oh, I don't, I, yeah, I'm not sure about the size of the individuals, but they they, they multiply, so, that, so this is how they form these giant, you know, carpets Bunches because they're just, 
Anyway. They just keep adding on to the colonial organism. So if I look up sea vomit on Google, I can figure they'll describe it. Right you'll, yes. Yeah, you'll also see a lot of people getting sick overboard. <laughs> <laughs> so be that, careful. That might not be pretty. Um, it's, uh, if you want the scientific name, it's called didenum vexillum. Wow. So vexillum is another clue to... It's also called rock vomit. You might want to search for that. And see yeah. That. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. It's called, yeah. That's, uh, that's a little safer to search on. I don't on. think I've ever seen it. That. Well, it, I'm telling you, if you, you're paddling through Richardson Bay along the um, along the docks in Sausalito, you just look over and you see all this yellow. Yeah, it's, it's all over the, the docks. <laughs> yeah, and, and so the problem with these invasive species is once they're that established, there's no getting rid of them. Yeah, they're they're here. Well, that actually was something that they. Um, They've tested different things, like up in Alaska, where it's having an impact on the herring fishery. They've, you know, tried like super hot water, and you know, they finally found a, a nudibranch that eats the sea vomit. But you know, again, when, when humans try to do nature engineering, it usually doesn't end well. So if we were to import an invasive nudibranch, you know, we have only yeah, ask New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention.